Hello and welcome to another episode of Laying Down the Lore 40k, a lore podcast in which we aim to separate our Ducari from our Dark Angels, our Tyranids from our Tau, and our Craft Worlds from our Chaos Marines, and generally ask, what's up with this Warhammer 40k stuff? My name is Ben Crone Barbara, and I know pretty much fuck all about 40k. With me is my co-host, Christopher Crallen Allen. Blah, 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 blah. Who knows absolutely fuck all about 40k. Blah, 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 blah. And my dear brother, Darren. Hello. Who knows so much about 40k, it's a wonder he has time to do anything else. Over the years, this dichotomy between our levels of understanding became clear, and this series is an attempt to address that... Dichotomy! <laughs> Ignorance! <laughs> Harumbo! Speak. <laughs> <Ooh>. Speak, <laughs> Speak, priest! <laughs> Speak, priest! <laughs> Father! <laughs> I feel like we've uh, we've really taken on the Ecclesiarchy episode from last time. Exactly. We got, we're getting our faith on, yo. <laughs> when you say you've taken it on, how much have you taken on? Uh, I'm not wearing any trousers. <laughs> <laughs> right, Kral, what's your favorite um, kind of... Taking group? it in the rectory. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's your favorite position for taking it in the rectory? Um, what, um, what favorite group from the churchy episode? What would you go with? Uh, the sisters is too obvious. I mean, they're they're up there, aren't they? I think. In, I am that. I right in thinking that um, the uh, the sisters of battle are probably the the most popular out of the ecclesiarchy? Darren, would you say people love them the most? Uh, in general, yes, because the ecclesiarchy isn't really a homogenous force that you can play on the tabletop without it being the sisters of battle, and then the arco-flagellants and maybe a, a preacher mm. and the pennant engines plugged in. Mm, um, mm, so, mm. yeah, I'd say the Sisters of Battle is a fairly popular force. They've got to be, haven't they? Mine's going to be the arco-flagellants, just the fucking lobotomized, like... Flaily arms. Sw- yeah, flaily arms, wacky, flaily... <laughs> w- wacky, <arm> waving, inflatable <laughs> arm flailing. Conflagulations <laughs> and jubilations. <laughs> yeah, jacked up on, like, hammer juice and just flailing their way to victory. <laughs> hammer time! Yeah, hammer yeah, juice. Nice. <laughs> hammer juice. That's, that's bad. Okay, belief systems then. Okay, if you had to adhere to... I'm sure there were more... I'm going to give you three. Okay, so one is the standard ecclesiarchy who believe that the emperor is God, and and that's that. Oh, sorry, and that for a while that church and state were together. Is that that's yeah. is that? Yeah, it was the ecclesiarchy, but it was under the rule of that bastard. Then the second option would be the federation of light. Was that confederation what they were called? Con- of light. Confederation of light. Yeah. The yeah, Confederation yeah. of Light, and they believe that they should be separate, but still, obviously, saw the uh, Emperor as a god. And then the yeah, the yeah. Admech, the Adeptus Mechanicus, who see the Emperor as a manifestation of the Omni Sire. Mm, okay, thinking. I mean, I'm pretty agnostic and liberal. I guess the closest would be the Confederation of Light. Maybe keep them separate. Yeah. Never shall yeah, they. Yeah. Merge, state and church. I think that would be yeah. my the closest match to me. What about you, Darren, with your hair? Well, and, I'm, and your face. I'm fair. <laughs> and, and your face and your clothes. <laughs> Standing there in your shorts. I'm fairly progressive, but also ultra conservative. So I'd probably just go with regular ecclesiarchy. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, going to top yeah. off this trifecta by going with the Omni Sire because, <laughs> I mean, he's a machine god. Fuck yeah. <laughs> 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 and we all know Ben is part machine. Yes. Exactly. Well, which part? Um, My heart. <laughs> his dongle. His dingle dangle. His dongle. His dingle dangle. <laughs> Speaking of dingle dangles, if you guys have a look on WhatsApp, I just shared a picture of an arcoflagellant at rest. What the fuck? At rest. Just chilling. At rest. He's just sitting down. He's just sitting down. Is he? Oh, they look a lot more beasty than I thought. We're going to, I'll stick that in the show notes, but it's a, it's a classic, uh, a classic image of an arcoflagellant. 
Yeah, okay, yeah, that, that doubles down my uh, my choice of arco-flagellants. Yeah, imagine that they coming look- at you. Coming at yeah. you like mechanical Cleopatra. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I. That's cool. Is, is he got stuff plugged into his penis? No, his penis is plugged into other stuff. <laughs> no, he's got stuff coming down from his stomach that's covering that area. Right, okay. But he's basically a Ken doll, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the first thing that they remove. Or it's been replaced with like a chainsaw, a little mini chainsaw. <laughs> yeah, a machine gun. <laughs> 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 and my penis <laughs> is a bazooka. <laughs> <laughs> and my penis is an organ rocket launcher. That was another <laughs> amazing thing from last episode. Do you remember that, Krell? The Henry Mancini <laughs> organ. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Play it again, <laughs> Sam. <laughs> 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 oh, all things bright and beautiful. <laughs> woof, 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 woof. So can I just ask, when the person, the, the operator is playing this keyboard, is it also playing music while it's yes. firing the things? That's yeah. fucking brilliant. That's so funny. <laughs> Do they have to match the tone from the, uh, the rocket? It's got loads of different rocket sizes. <laughs> Here comes the bride. <laughs> Here comes the brides of the emperor. <laughs> Here comes the film. <laughs> so we've covered in the past couple of episodes. We've covered the uh, bureaucratic elements of the Imperium of Man. We've covered the faithful elements. Last episode with the Ecclesiarchy and the Adeptus Sororitas, which is the the kind of faith and faithful of the Imperium of Man. We're now going to go to the third table leg that supports the flat top of the Imperium of Man, thus protecting the holy buffet of the Emperor. Nice analogy. Nice uh, analogy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's the equivalent of that. Is it the little little table thing that you get in pizzas? <laughs> to, stop the, to stop the roof collapsing on the topping. To, to stop the horrific damp cardboard of chaos from touching <laughs> the precious yeah, exactly. and pure pepperoni of humanity. Amazing. Of Papa Mario's <laughs> <laughs> Imperium of Man. Imperium of Man. In pepperoni of Man. <laughs> what I thought we'd look at in uh, this episode is the the, the kind of two great military institutions of the Imperium that make up 99% of all kind of military force that isn't owned either by the Ecclesiarchy or by the Adeptus Mechanicus or indeed by the Space Marines. So we're looking by far at the effectively untold billions of soldiers within the Astra Militarum or Imperial Guard as was, We'll also have a look at the kind of naval forces of the Imperium. So we're looking at the Imperial Navy. This is the spacefaring navy, not the puddle hoppers that you would get uh, on backwater planets like our own. Well, then I thought we'd round out as a kind of really good juxtaposition in terms of how the Imperium makes war and how it makes total war, as our uh, good friend von Clauschwitz would say, by looking at the the assassins, the officio oh. assassinorum. These are the one-man kill squads uh, ah, that can cool. turn the tide of any battle and indeed avert battle and heresy before uh, such things even began. So what we'll do, I think, is we'll start with the origins of the Navy and the Imperial Guard or the Astra Militarum because they share a source. And as we'll all be familiar with by now, it comes at the end of the Horus Heresy. One of the reasons why the Horus Heresy was so devastating as a conflict was that commanders of ground troops also commanded interstellar craft. So each regiment or each large organization and body of troops 
had their own naval assets. They were a complete army under the control of one commander, which meant that if that commander decided to go to planet X, drop some troops on one side and nuke the shit out of the other side, they were free to do so with very little kind of entanglement uh, uh, or restrictions. And that was really why Horus was able to cause such damage. I mean, the big focus of the Horus heresy is on the space marines, the legions of Astartes that were under the command of both sides. But by far, the most numerous types of troop were ordinary, in quotes, humans. You had some that were chemically augmented, some that were biologically augmented, indeed some that were emotionally augmented, very secure, grounded troops <laughs> that had no family issues whatsoever. <laughs> no baggage. Yeah, exactly right. Well, except for a, a backpack full of ammunition. Except for the baggage, yeah. yeah. <laughs> except for the baggage. <laughs> no baggage except for the baggage. No emotional baggage. And really, a lot of the military forces were autonomous. You know, you had kind of uh, robber barons that could go off at a moment's notice and carry robber ground buttons. troops. Robber buttons. What? Go fuck yourself. Uh, you then had it. <laughs> at the end of the Horus Heresy, when uh, Rabuti Guliman was redefining what it means to be an army and what it means to be a Space Marine Legion, uh, he severed the link between terrestrial troops, as in those troops that need are needed for ground invasion or defense, from the naval assets that could bring them from one area to another. Right. And primarily that was done so that a renegade commander of a, a world would not be able to get their military might to another world. Right. The most they could do is maybe go to another world in their system, but they were trapped within a given system. They couldn't transport their their forces out of that without uh, tacit approval uh, from the Imperial Navy. Oh, I see. That's quite clever. It also meant that Imperial Navy commanders who went renegade had no forces with which to be able to resupply, to capture significant stockpiles, nor could they initiate planetary assaults. They had no ground troops of any kind of quality that could uh, conquer planets. Now, that not only applied to individual renegade commanders, but if you had a renegade admiral, say, which is the ultimate nightmare in the kind of new world order of the Imperium, you're talking... You know, an average fleet is somewhere between 50 to 75 vessels of significant size and power. They could dominate a region of space, but they couldn't really control uh, a planet. They have no forces with which to invade a planet. They could bombard it into oblivion. Of course they could, but they couldn't harvest any resources from it. Mr. Chris? I'd argue like most armies would struggle to actually commandeer a, a planet truly anyway in terms of like the infrastructure. So you go in with your military might and um, there's a military coup, you take over, and then what? You've got to then win the hearts and minds of people or at least convince people out of fear or loyalty to run the place. There's the whole infrastructure side of stuff. Absolutely correct. The one thing we'd need to factor in is for most of these planets, there's a single family in charge and a single planetary governor. If you're able to exert influence over that planetary governor, you effectively own the planet. Mm. What mm. you would need to do is you would need to, if you're rebelling against the Imperium, is in very, very short order, within a matter of hours, you need to get rid of all Imperial presence there, including the astropaths, including the uh, the armoured precincts of the, the Arbites and the any kind of ecclesiarchal influence so mm. that you can guarantee there's no signals coming out. Now, a few well-placed uh, kind of broadsides from a, a significantly sized ship could probably take care of that. But even then, as you say, you're dealing with fairly fanatical, faithful populace that mm. you have to... Mm try and um try and bring to uh, compliance yeah 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 so at the end of the the horus heresy the imperial army as was which was the combined combination of naval 
assets and ground troops in singular commands was split into the Imperial Guard, or Astra Militarum, as they became known in, uh, in Gothic, uh, and the Imperial Navy. So you had terrestrial-based troops and interstellar or space-based troops. So um, I thought we'd just have a look at the naval assets first, because we've dealt to some extent with what's required to travel through space when we talked about rogue traders uh, and navigators. So, of course, every ship requires a navigator to be able to travel through the warp. We should note from the outset that when we're discussing the Imperial Navy, for the vast majority of the time in 40k, it was not really very well defined at all. It was only until the release of a game called Battlefleet Gothic, where they really dived into spacefaring combat, where you could control a small fleet or squadron made up of uh, cruisers and uh, squadrons of escort uh, vehicles and fight against the forces of Chaos and Orcs and Eldar and later on Tau and Crute. There was a, a, a lot of kind of really quality information and quality models that you could play. And it was a really good game. And in fact, it was a game developed by Andy Chambers in his spare time when he wasn't actually day-to-day -day <laughs> wow. working on developing 40k lore and rules for the kind of second edition onwards he just had this idea for a game tinkering away in the background and uh, developed wow, it and it amazing. was uh, adopted by the the company hopefully he was paid loser <laughs> <laughs> i'm joking andy you're all right well let's uh, let's uh, kind of start at the top then with the Imperial Navy. So there are five broad kind of segmentum fleets and guess what they're tied to? That's correct, the segmentums of the Imperium of Man. So with segmentum Ooh. Solar, Obscurus, <laughs> Tempestus Ultima and Pacificus. Each one of these Pacificus can never say that. Pacificus. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's very vague that one that, very vague that and espresso i can never say those two fucking words and, then, and, and of course there is the all gold lame fleet the uh for the segmentum splendiferous that even as i said it <laughs> even as i said it i realized I like, that i had just... nothing I had nothing. <laughs> I was like, this setup is too long. This is going nowhere. <laughs> going nowhere. I actually started thinking about what I need to do next week. <laughs> Halfway through talking, I just checked out. <laughs> uh, you and me both, brother. <laughs> Each one of these segmentum fleets is headquartered at a forge world. Now, we'll talk about the Adeptus Mechanicus. In fact, next episode... But a forge world is a single factory world. It's a world that is, as the clue suggests, is a single factory. A forge world specializes in an aspect of technology. So Ryza, which is a forge world, they specialize in plasma weapons, or they have uh, retained okay. the information for plasma weapons. So they make plasma weapons of all sizes and all scales and of all powers to fit on starships and plasma pistols for ground troops and everything in between right okay they used to make plasma tvs but that market quickly <laughs> quickly deteriorated in the advent of ocd and lcd technology didn't it? yeah that's it yeah. do you know what i love about you chris is i would i would have bailed halfway through that <laughs> you just gotta commit full send just gotta commit Fuck it own it <laughs> So each one of these forge worlds, and let's say Segmentum Solar, uh, which is based, the fleet is based at Mars. And so Mars has a ring around it, which is uh, simply shipyards uh, and all the ancillary needs they would have to have to create ships. Some of these ships are so large that they can only be produced at kind of in really space. major ma really major forge world. almost all spaceships are made in space in 40k <laughs> almost oh, the ones at scale anyway yeah all right final assembly done <laughs> off planet I done off planet yeah. fucking prefab the two grim yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> flat packed out into orbit 
put together, <laughs> frustrating me by a bunch of men who just refuse to read the fucking rules. Just read the fucking instructions. And then you always get like one bolt left over. You're like, I hope that wasn't and important. They're like, oh, I'm sure. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And then on its maiden voyage, the whole thing just unravels. <laughs> yeah. Warp speed, Mr. Zuda. <laughs> <laughs> So each of these segmentum fleets is led by a Lord High Admiral. So there are five Lord High Admirals within the Imperium of Man, one of which is entitled to sit on the High Lords of Terra, the High Council. So these are not petty functionaries. These are uh, men and women of real power. Each High Admiral is serviced, if you can uh, use that phrase, by a full suite of other admirals and commodores and captains who manage, maintain, and other words such like that, the fleets under them. Each fleet, each segmentum fleet, is not a single entity. It is broken up into sector fleets. And that's really the base administrative level for management and combat and and and. They are referred to as battle fleets, one of the most famous being Battlefleet Gothic, which was the name of the uh, the name of the game that uh, Mr. Chambers created. Each sector battle fleet, so that's a, a Battlefleet Gothic, Gothic, there being a Gothic sector, uh, right next to the emo sector, adjacent to the punk <laughs> sector. <laughs> so each Battle fleet comprises of between 50 and 75 heavy vessels. These can be cruiser grade vessels, plus probably a similar number of escort vessels. Uh, these are small or more nimble craft, not prostitutes. Mr. Chris. <laughs> um, how The largest of these ships, how big are they? Are we talking miles long? How many football fields in length are we talking? Okay. Uh, you can <laughs> generally break down the types of craft. There, there are innumerable different variations on a theme, but there tends to be kind of six broad chassis classes the shortest of which is a destroyer and that comes in at just under one kilometer long okay and they tend to be these are the, like the system patrol craft they are mm. warp capable all of these craft are warp warp travel capable but in general they're used to support the larger cruisers uh, the next up then is frigate and the next one after that is a light cruiser both of those fit somewhere between one and a half to three kilometers in length. Okay, mm, so these are okay. not small craft. Now, these three craft, light cruisers, frigates, and destroyers, are deployed in squadrons. There is at least two. The average size uh, destroyers are fielded in three. Frigates can be two or three. Light cruisers are usually two. But they are not defenseless vessels. Each one of them could destroy a city from orbit. Mm -hmm. It's wow. a fairly sizable arsenal that they have available to them. Really, the more impressive ones you're looking at are a cruiser, which tends to be somewhere between five to six kilometers long, mm. you know, and displacing millions of tons of space mm. in terms of their mass. Uh, and will have a crew, cruisers in general, you know, easily 100,000 people wow. on the ship and that's that's the kind of almost skeleton crew there are some estimates for some vehicles or some vessels that go up to 250 to 300,000 you know complement of crew on such vessels oh, sure. but really it depends on how they're loaded out so if a cruiser has just broadsides it just has uh, broadside batteries they're called macro batteries they fire either plasma rounds or huge shells about the size of an aircraft or laser batteries that uh, do that. Each one of those types of weapons requires a different type and number of crewmen to staff it and operate it. Mm. But that's it, cruisers. Grand cruisers are a step above that. They're roughly the same size, but are far more heavily armored. They're what's called ironclads in general. 
all of the ships I'm describing at the minute have void shields, which are the similar type of shields that Titans have. That uh, there are force fields effectively that stop uh, high velocity and high energy munitions from getting through to damage the actual craft. But in terms of armor, a destroyer would have a foot's worth of solid armor plus shields. They might have a secondary hull inside, so they're fairly well armored. A grand cruiser, and indeed the one above, which is the battleship, they can have a series of foot-thick hulls broken through and, and with bracing throughout and bulkheads, uh, and then a significant number of void shields on top of that, which means that they can just plow straight into the heart of an enemy formation uh, and decimate it uh, with broadsides and uh, their other weaponry. The grandest... Of- That's your fuck hammer in the fleet. That's your big fuck hammer right there. Yeah, mum. The Grand yeah. Cruiser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, the, uh, and then you... that's the Nelson breaking the line technique, isn't it? Just go, <laughs> yeah. just go pell-mell at the enemy, and then when you're adjacent to them, let rip. Yeah, that's absolutely. It. You then have the, each fleet, each battle fleet, tends to have one or two battleships. There are exceptions to this rule, of course. These are, at the most, eight and a half to nine kilometers long, which is Ooh, what? Big boys. Five, five miles? Five and a half miles? Mm, fuck me. Right. Uh, and they will... must be humongous. Oh, yeah. Actually, you're in space. You could just turn on a sixpence, really, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah but the, the inertia would drive all your crew members into whatever is in front of them. Uh, so, yeah, right. so you'd, have to come, you'd have to slow right down before you did it. I wonder what the braking distance is on there. On a five mile cruise, it's a right? it's probably me- it's probably measured in casualties. <laughs> <laughs> it's not distance; it's just the number of dead bodies you would incur. Uh, so oh, these no. these battleships are effectively cathedrals of war. That's how you would describe them. They are so ornate; they are just bedecked with. I was about to say bejazzled. They are bedecked with statues, <laughs> bejazzled. Uh, Let's go with it. Scrolled works, kind of. Uh, Gothic architecture, filial spires, the whole kind pimped of thing. to the max. Absolutely <laughs> pimping. Under lighting, yeah, under chassis yeah. lighting, oh, yeah. <laughs> perpetual spinning rims that spin independently of the wheel itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fucking. Yeah. And, and of course, wheels. <laughs> and of course, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 space wheels. <laughs> space wheels. <laughs> or, or engines. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Each of these craft is really uh, uh, the Imperium of Man uh, in a microcosm. The captain or commodore, commodores tend to be in charge of a squadron. So the destroyers, like the most uh, famous in the game being Cobra destroyers, each one would have a captain, but the the captain who is in charge would be promoted temporarily to commodore, and they would be in charge of the squadron there but each captain is effectively the emperor on his own ship what he says goes or or what they say go there are of course uh, many genders of captain in the imperium of man each one is then supported by a series of officers of you know all the ranks you can imagine all the naval ranks you can imagine including lieutenants masters of the watch You've got engine seers who are uh, representatives of the Adeptus Mechanicus, who, of course, need to be on the ship to keep it running and to make sure that it's uh, working as as designed. They have members of the Ecclesiarchy will be on board to protect the faith of the crew. Uh, You have the navigators, of course, and astropaths as well. So there's all aspects of the kind of the infrastructure of the Imperium appear within each ship. So what I've just described there, every ship has that. Uh, Mr. Chris. Sorry, keep. I'm, I'm kind of continuing off on this tangent. I don't want to go on too long, but it's just spurring, inspiring more questions. So many mouths to feed. When, when you've got a fleet out in the midst of space on a campaign, how do you feed and water them? Do they just supply up before they before they dispatch for their campaign? Or do they have constant deliveries going to and from? Or do they have their own onboard? They say self-sustainable. Is it corpse starch all the way? 
there will be an element of corpse starch for the larger vessels because you know you're you're looking at the battleships are effectively mini hive cities but mm. these are ships that are constantly being resupplied there's a logistic effort involved and indeed the fleet sometimes protects well usually protects the vast convoys of food that go from agri worlds to hive worlds there's a constant to and fro mm. between planets the sheer volume of traffic beggars belief. Uh, and, you know, why there are not more collisions in space is uh, <laughs> uh, certainly a, a testament to the will of the emperor, I suspect. <laughs> um, I have two questions just on the, the ship classes. Uh, do all five, sorry, was it five? No, six. all six. All, do all six classes have Geller field? So they're all capable of warp travel. Yes, and, they absolutely do. Right. And if, um, you know, in terms of a Space Marine Legion, say in Heresy or Chapter in 40K, would they have a fleet in which all the Marines would be populating all six uh, classes of ship? Or are they specifically just in battleships? Or, or all? Um, Well, it, it, we'll cover Astartes' fleets when we cover the Astartes, but in general, they have things called battle barges, uh, which are on the same kind of scale as battleships, but these are more heavily armored and more heavily armed, but they're heavily armed specifically with the view of taking over a planet. So they have right. bombardment cannons that can that can literally destroy a city in a single round. Um, they have strike cruisers, which are kind of fast response uh, vehicles or vessels, sorry, that will carry a single company of space marines. So a hundred space marines will be on board, and these can be these can initiate uh, planetary assaults with drop pods. So right. the separation between ground troops and naval assets did not apply to the Astartes. Right. So the Astartes, what happened was their number, the, the size of each force was reduced to a thousand rather than hundreds of thousands or indeed billions. There, I finally <laughs> said it. <laughs> it's quite a jump. Um, it, I'm assuming that the inside of these battle barges or other vessels that the Space Marines occupy are different in scale given the size difference of Marines. Yes. I mean, space is going to be at a premium. And so most ships have a central wide corridor through which troops and uh, crew can uh, pass quickly from one section to another. It's also where parades can be held within each ship mm. to mark uh, special holidays within the Imperium. Emperor Day. Victories. Emperor Day. Exactly right. <laughs> Ascension. Well, you're laughing. There's an Ascension Day, which is effectively Emperor Day. Does uh, that mark the end of the heresy that day? Ascension day. It marks the ascension of the emperor from mortal to god. Ah, but would, that didn't necessarily happen on the day the heresy ended. Uh, I think it marks it marks the calendar, the Terran calendar day that it actually happened, where he right. went into the golden throne. Right, I'd need okay. to do a bit more reading up to see if that was actually the date, but uh, I, I believe it is. Don't ask me what date it is. I have no idea. The fifteenth of July, let's say. 2nd of June. Moving on. Uh, (laughs) So, but that central corridor on a battleship is going to be incredibly wide and impressive. On a destroyer, it's going to be quite narrow. So Mm. uh, you've got to imagine if you've ever watched a drama that takes place on a submarine, for the vast majority of these ships, it's going to be like that. It's going to be cramped unless there needs to be an area where a lot of bodies need to move quickly. Mm. A good example of this is in Battlefleet Gothic, in the rulebook, they had an image of a a shell being loaded into something called a Nova Cannon, which is a, a cannon that's on the, the prow, on the, on the front of a, a, one of these large cruisers. And usually, one would assume it's this kind of conveyor belt system and the shell is loaded in automatically but in the image you see that the shell is being dragged by several hundred crewmen on a a kind of very gangly looking winch uh, and launched and loaded into 
the chamber to be fired. And this kind of underscores the lack of understanding of some of this technology uh, as it's been eroded away over thousands of years. Right. We, we talked about that before, where technology that still works is they maintain it as best they can, but sometimes they forget how it works exactly. And so that's is an example of them. Um, they just regress. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Is there gravity on these ships or do they float? Around? Uh, yes, there is gravity. Uh, okay, fine. They cool. have mysterious gravity plates that, that work there. Each ship, as I had uh, mentioned, or each vessel, is uh, configured in a certain way uh, with certain weapons. But in general, uh, this breaks down into three or four different types. So the first we've discussed uh, a moment ago, which is macro weaponry. These are the broadsides. If you can imagine a naval battle in our own our own world, it's the, the broadsides where it's destroying uh, everything left and right of you. Uh, and as I say, these can be large bore shells, these can be uh, laser batteries, these can be plasma batteries. You then have something called lances, and these are usually mounted on the surface, on the on the, the kind of ventral plane of the vessel, and these are high-powered laser weapons used for sniping at long distance. So broadsides... Yep, exactly right. So broadsides will decimate anything that's within a few kilometers of you. Uh, lances can go out uh, 10 kilometers or more, depending on the power and the focal length uh, of the, the weapon in question. Mr. Chris. These are on the front of the uh, the battleships. So when you can they say they can snipe, they're quite they're more precision than anything. Yeah. But you're talking relative to the size of the ship. So it's not like a fucking huge sniper rifle which will take out a single person unit. These will take out other single ships, for example. That's what you mean by sniping in that context. They're they're yes, they're primarily designed or they're primarily used to take out void shields. To get oh, okay. rid, to strip the shields at distance, so that when you get close enough, your broadside can be absolutely devastating. It can just mince in through the superstructure of the vessel. But you can, if you get lucky, you can take out quite. A, you know, you can blow. You can. Uh, I was about to say, you can blow off some escorts. You can destroy mm, some mm, escort mm, vessels mm. and damage <laughs> them. Um, you can mm. blow off some escorts too. You know, I mean. It's- you can do both. Free country. It's all I'm saying. You can do both. It's all Free I'm country. saying. Find you a ship that'll do both. <laughs> you then get into torpedoes. and Oh, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing it wrong. Darren, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> whoa, Which, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't get in there. <laughs> and, and this allows you to trombone your enemy from a great distance. <laughs> There's various <laughs> types. Plasma warheads, uh, vortex warheads, which pull in aspects of the warp very quickly, kind of a warp flash, melt a warheads, <laughs> warp flash, melt a warheads, which, well, melt. They're a super thermic reaction and can melt through the hull of a, of a ship. And then you get the more kind of oddly reassuring, which is the boarding torpedoes, which is Damn. a giant torpedo filled with people. Mr. Chris. I just wanted to say, you know, if the podcast doesn't, take off you could always be a great arms salesperson we got plasma <laughs> torpedoes we got melted torpedoes they will obliterate your enemy in a blink of an eye <laughs> we got big we, ones we got small ones we got smelly <laughs> ones we got <laughs> we we got torpedoes inside torpedoes that's right we have a torpedo <laughs> torpedo <laughs> i'm just picturing dar as uh, as tony stark at the start of his iron man 2 demonstrating kind of the is it the jericho i think it's called yeah, it's, <laughs> it's just a cluster bomb like amazing oh. i have been told i do look like tony stark with depression anyway moving on <laughs> We then have, the, as I say, the boarding torpedoes, and these are filled with what's referred to as armsmen, which are the the void troops of the Imperial Navy. The, the, to some extent, you would class them as the Marines. These are the troops that deal in boarding actions, both in attack and defense, and they're the kind of the soldiers of space, as it were. These boarding torpedoes are chock full of them. And what they'll do is they'll just, if you excuse the phrase, penetrate the outer hull of your uh, your uh, enemy ship. Just a load of arms men into it. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Spill all inside it. Oh my! It's, oh, it's every. Oh, they're everywhere. <laughs> and, and because of inertia, they just come flying out. <laughs> <laughs> we <laughs> arms first. Superman dive out the torpedo. <laughs> And and then as we've mentioned we've got the Nova cannons, the ones that are mounted on the prow of the ship, and these can hit targets, uh, you know, several hundred thousand kilometers away. They are significantly powerful. A lot of ships that don't have Nova cannons or torpedo bays, because you can't have both, are fixed with a ram. Nice. So these ships will pl- literally plow into each other. But as uh, as you've uh, correctly alluded to earlier, these are mostly fitted upon what would be classed as ironclads. These are the ones that just are built to withstand a tremendous amount of destruction uh, and will snap the bridge, snap the, the chassis of another vessel. Mr. Chris? If you're going to um, ram your own grand cruiser, your heavily ironclad grand cruiser into something else, you mm. better make sure, you better be absolutely certain that your momentum, inertia, and mass is a lot greater than theirs. Because let's say <laughs> you're going at very fucking fast towards something full of hundreds of yeah. thousands of souls and it stops. That's a lot of death all of a sudden. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Lot it of, needs to plow straight through. No questions asked. No, no give. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Well, I mean, are you, sorry, are you talking about the 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 the, the whole ship ramming? Because I guess the the same is true of the the boarding torpedoes. Isn't it? You just ram a bunch <laughs> of people just compressed into a torpedo, the <laughs> and it just crashes into the side of the ship, and then the door is open, and it's just fucking tomato soup inside. <laughs> <laughs> Just one guy twitching well, I mean, at the back. It, Kill me. <laughs> in the game, in Battlefleet Gothic, I mean, a lot of your uh, ships have point defense weapons, which try and shoot down torpedoes as they're coming in. So, mm. for a lot of armsmen in this boarding uh, raid, the boarding torpedo raid, it's absolutely a one way mission. Mm, but. Wow. There is a percentage chance that not only can they successfully get inside the superstructure of the enemy ship, they can head to the bridge and take command of the ship. Uh, And then suddenly, not only have you taken the ship out of commission uh, in terms of it's no longer a threat because you now control it, but if you're able to get it restarted before the crew scuttle the ship, uh, you can get off a few broadsides or some lance shots or torpedo mm. bay shots at your enemy from within their own ranks. Uh, so it's a worthwhile tactic, considering that human life is eminently expendable within the Imperium of Man. Mm. It's such an Imperium of Manism, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> fire your torpedoes willy-nilly into the sides of stuff till it penetrates the target and then just unloads its load into it. <laughs> yeah. so, Sploosh. So predictable. I, uh, I, I don't know if you intended to, Chris, but that you've made that sound very erotic. <laughs> yeah. Wave after wave of my own men. <laughs> wave after wave of my own tomato sauce. That was the idea, yeah. One of the things uh, I didn't touch on, and we'll close out this section of on the Imperial Navy, is the carrier capacity. A lot of these craft have uh, smaller air or void craft in their holes. And in fact, some of the larger carriers, some of the battleship size carriers, have a thousand types of craft inside them ready to go, much like an aircraft carrier. So they're broken down really into two sections. The first is void craft. So you have what's referred to as the Fury Fighter. This is a star fighter in general, crewed by three pilots, but it's the size of a 747. So it, it, that's a fighter. That's the ones that are trying to gain superiority of the airspace around or the space around a ship. And in some cases, communication and coordination is so important that each of these Fury fighters has an astropath strapped into a fourth seat. seat. So you've got this blind psyker screaming at the top of his lungs as you're tearing around the place. (laughs) <laughs> in in dog fights, which I just think is hilarious. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll pass over. You then have um, <laughs> these uh, a bomber, a Starhawk bomber, which is about the size of an aircraft carrier. 
what we would r- refer to as an aircraft carrier in our naval uh, battles. And they're purely designed to drop melted charges onto uh, spaceships, onto, onto enemy vessels, and absolutely nice. mince them. Mr. Chris? You don't drop them in space, you'd launch them. Again, there's no gravity kind of drawing it to them, right? Moving on, the second part <laughs> of the uh, the uh, the Imperial Navy's force. I think, I think you'll find, Chris, that what he meant is dropping them in relation to the ship itself. Right. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I'm sure that's what Darren meant. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly yeah. what he meant. Look, you can yeah. see it on his face. What what you can't see on his face is rage at your incessant grammar <laughs> not seeing. <laughs> not grammar. It's physics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking hell oh, you pedantic son of a bitch i did have another question but this is this is probably more of a discussion point between me and ben brian and things like that. it was more about like you've got these huge you've got a fleet of these huge ships you've got six different kinds of ships several of each in each fleet that's a lot of mass like easily the mass of our moon or something like that would that have some sort of effect gravitational effect on planets i think i'm splitting hairs a bit here too much but yeah, it's worth considering. No, I, th- I think you're correct to say that the bombs are launched rather than dropped in void warfare. No, we're beyond Perhaps, that. We're about gravity. We're talking about uh, gravity. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so am I, Chris. It's the difference between launch and dropped is gravity, you prick. The, uh, <laughs> the difference between launch and dropped is spelling, Darren. All right? <laughs> I suspect it would do, yes. I suspect you're, you're dealing with a fleet of millions upon millions of tons of, uh, of metal in space, it, there would be gravitational uh, effects. Yeah. As I was saying there before, I was so physically interrupted. The second type of craft that these carriers have uh, de- deal with close support for planetary troops. Uh, so it's air cover like literally air cover when you're on a planet and there's no question that there is gravity. You have uh, the... (laughs) No? Oh, thanks, Chris. The two most common are uh, the lightning strike fighter and the thunderbolt heavy fighter. Both of these uh, are used to gain air superiority. So these are orbital craft that can be suborbital as well. So they will fly around in the sky and then return up to the void craft, their home base, or they can be used to help establish an airfield on the planet for uh, more speedy response times. With them come bombers, the most common being the Marauder bomber, and these are the you know regular human-sized 747s covered in weapons for uh, hitting the ground, but also bombs as well. So they have many auto cannons, assault cannons, heavy bolters, that kind of thing. And then for the really up close and personal touch, you have uh, Valkyrie transports. And these are the, you know, the I've forgotten the name of the helicopters. Is it the B-1 in uh, Vietnam? These are the ones that fly in carrying troops, but mm. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an aircraft. It's a troop carrying aircraft that can uh, has some level of VTOL operation, and supporting them are the Vulture gunships. These are like the Apache helicopters, but it's a it's a craft that has VTOL. It can hover and uh, take out enemy units in support of a, a, a kind of hot LZ landing. Was the um, the Vietnam helicopter? Was it not the Huey? Yes, there we go. It was the, the Huey. Huey. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So really, that's the Imperial Navy. They are, you know, a hammer of the kind of Imperial force. They protect rogue traders. They protect uh, shipments of not only food and weapons, but also of pilgrims. They are charged with accompanying uh, Mechanicum Explorator fleets that are going out to try and find new technology. So anytime there is an an official shipment being made whether it's of people or goods there's one or more there's at least one escort squadron with each of these types of caravans of these interstellar trade caravans so anywhere you find a, a craft in space there's usually an imperial navy vessel not too far away uh, and it really kind of spreads the influence of the Imperium outside of planetary concerns 
into the space between the stars. Nice. Oh. I mean, ooh. <laughs> ooh. <laughs> Iran, ooh. Was that the right oh. reaction? <laughs> I, have no, I have no idea. I stopped listening to you after Gravity Gate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Darren. <laughs> Thoughts on the Imperial Navy? Um, awesomely massive and epic. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Um, big. Real big numbers. <laughs> I was at uh, Chatham Historic Dockyard uh, last weekend with uh, with the parental units. And, oh, yeah. Um, Hello, sailor. It's, <laughs> oy, oy. And they had, oy, um, oy. it's basically, it was the main, one of the main shipyards, um, shipbuilding yards um, during the 17th and 18th century, I think it was, or the 17th and 1800s, should I say. They have a thing called a rope walk, which I had no idea was the thing. It's a mi- It's a quarter of a mile long building in which they basically, once the fibers have been made into yarn, they then spin them into ropes of the yeah. varying sizes, all the way up to the ones that are like over a foot in diameter that they use for the big anchors. But that building was a quarter of a mile long. It took us 10 minutes or so, maybe 10, 15 minutes to walk. I mean, we were we were, am, we were uh, ambling. Down, meandering. We weren't, meandering, yeah. But so when you say a ship that's like over five miles long, I still can't really picture that because I still can't really even picture the size of the warehouse that we were in. You couldn't <laughs> see the other end, basically. When you came yeah. in one side, you could not. It, it disappeared into a vanishing point. So five miles long is bananas. That's five miles, isn't it? That's fucking huge. Well, it's five yeah. miles. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> several <laughs> quarter miles, isn't it? Yeah. If you can imagine five miles, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> picture six miles, you've gone too far. <laughs> I bet they've got more than one retail district in each of these like super cruises as well. Yeah, you need you need some retail therapy. You're out, you know, you're out <laughs> for so long. Do you imagine one of the decks is a mall? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. You always yeah. get them on the like super cruises these days, don't you? Well, I mean, I can't wait to deep dive into the Imperial Navy because we, what we'll do is we'll go through the anatomy of one of these battle cruisers uh, deck by deck. And yeah, ma'am. it's just, Love it's staggering what's involved in, or, or do you know what? It's staggering the creativity that's gone into creating the ideas and concepts mm. of these vessels. Uh, but they do have yeah, bars. Yeah. There is, there are criminal organizations. There's an underground, there's a black market on each of these ships. You know, the ecclesiarchy is constantly at war with the commissariat. These are the kind of political officers of the fleet or of the Imperium. There's below deck dramas. Oh, a hundred percent. All the crew are sleeping with each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they have chlamydia. So yeah. <laughs> Space clap. Space clap. <laughs> no one can hear it because it's in a vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> Just goes, Listen, I tell you what, I had it in a vacuum once and fucking people could hear me. Ah, it's in a vacuum! (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) Even aliens like the Hrud are present on some Imperial ships. They become infested. So there's an absolute fuck ton more lore to go through for the Imperial Navy. And, and, And you know what? I'm really looking forward to it simply because... Battlefleet Gothic has been out of print for quite a while, and most of the 40k games are, you know, infantry uh, or armored vehicle based. Uh, so it'll be it'll be good to return to the that milieu. So now we'll take a, a look at the other half of the Great Divide at the end of the Heresy of Horus. I'm all right. Which was when the Imperial Army became the Imperial Guard or the Astra Militarum. As mentioned at the start of the episode, it saw the separation of foot troops from stellar travel uh, or from stellar assets, which meant that the Imperial Guard required transport to war zones where they were needed, and that's provided by the Imperial Army. Really, it's a very straightforward description in terms of the organization of an Imperial Guard regiment or an an Astra Militarum regiment, because it mirrors our own. It mirrors regiment uh, organizational structure in our own world. Each regiment is led by a colonel, 
and that colonel then has a, a command staff, a command company within that um, regiment, and then it has a separate number of companies within each regiment. Each company is made up of a certain amount of uh, platoons, and each platoon is somewhere between 20 to 50 individual soldiers led by a command squad. This means that regiments can get up to somewhere between 1,500 to 3,000, to some extent 5,000 troops per regiment. These regiments are usually based off of a single planet. That was one of the the after effects of the Great Divide at the end of the heresy, is that each regiment then became associated with a specific planet and became known as the Milam, Militarum Regimentos, which sounds like a very official suite. <laughs> <laughs> and this ties back to the previous episodes of the podcast where we've talked about the Katachan jungle fighters. These are oh, regiments of jungle that. fighters from the planet of Katachan or Katachan. Each planet will raise hundreds of regiments over its lifetime, up to even thousands of regiments over its lifetime. And one of the taxes that the Imperium imposes upon each planet and upon each planetary governor is the uh, levying of troops. So uh, in general, what you see is there are things, there's an entity called a planetary defense force. So each governor is required to raise regiments of uh, troops from their populace if they are able. These are to be highly trained, uh, proficient soldiers. And every now and then when the Imperium tithes against a planet for uh, raising a regiment, it is from these planetary defense forces that these regiments are built, either en masse, so a, a, a planetary defense regiment simply is taken up into space and taken off to another planet, or it's built from the best troops and the best units of a given uh, force or a given planetary defense force. And then the regiment is built that way and again taken off world, taken to a, directly to a war zone. So the level of training that is required is on par with the special force units that we have in our own world. These are by no means foot sloggers. Planetary defense forces have to be the highest, you know, they have to be incredibly highly capable, very well trained, very disciplined, very loyal, both to the Imperium in general, and to the God Emperor. As we said last episode, almost every action taken by a human in the Imperium is a vote of prayer, an offering to the God Emperor himself and an act of faith. So you have regiment, thousands, hundreds of thousands of regiments of elite level troops fighting on behalf of the Imperium of Man spread across the entire galaxy, usually in many different war zones. And so the kind of progression from a planetary defense force trooper to a member of the Astra Militarum involves them forming the regiment in whatever fashion. That regiment is then uploaded into a transport and training ship so these will be cruiser level sized ships that uh, purely deal with transporting and training troops on the way to a war zone. <laughs> so you're brought up into the ship and over in general about 18 months, you are, uh, your training is upped, your fitness level is constantly tested. These ships are equipped with various types of uh, simulated hangars for different environment types that you might encounter on the planet or war zone that you're heading to. So the troops can familiarize themselves with Arctic combat or jungle combat or desert combat or whatever's needed. Now, when you find yourself fighting on a jelly planet, you may find that the terrain is a little bit squishy. <laughs> what you got to do <laughs> you will not be reprovisioned you will be given a spork <laughs> are they they're already soldiers when they get on these training ships it's not like 
it's not like they've just recruited a load of people that never even fired a gun, and then 18 no, months later they, they drop them. Well, there have been occasions where that has been required if the levy is very, very tough. If, right. a, if a, a planetary governor has to raise 10 regiments, but he's only got six regiments of planetary defense forces. Fuck, just stick in a few horses or something. Just uh, They'll never notice. <laughs> I love the idea of a horse in a human costume. <laughs> we'll be. <laughs> Why can't you be more like Bruce? Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> Commissars, known across the galaxy for their ironclad discipline, are now stepping into the spotlight, bringing all new entertainment to the Imperium of Man in Commissars Do the Funniest Things. Join us weekly as we see the most amusing executions from all five segmentum. Each episode, we'll take a look at some of the classic Commissar-related topics such as insubordination, treachery, cowardice, and of course, idolatry. In our first episode, we take a look at psychic mishaps. What, what is that astropath doing? Is, is that snuff? No. No, by the throne he's going to sneeze. <laughs> An eagle! The Commissar's hat's now an eagle! And dereliction of duty. No, he doesn't see him. Commissar's peeking out from behind that bunker door. What's that guardsman do? Is he still focused on his watch? Wait. Oh no, he rubbed his eye. Whoa, wait for it. Get ready to witness the quirkiest executions, the most outrageous punishments, and the funniest moments from the grimmest corners of the galaxy. Commissars do the funniest things, where execution becomes an art of laughter. Viewing as mandatory, see your regimental commissariat for details. But in general, these are SAS, Delta Force, Green Beret... SEAL team level operators. And these are the foot troops of humanity in the regiments. It's a huge honor to have a member of your family being taken up into the Astra Militarum. And they're held in such high regard that the moment they are on the ship, they are already viewed as more effective and more loyal and held in higher regard than the regiment that they left from. Right. The lowest member of an Imperial Guard regiment will outrank a significant number of ranks within a planetary defense force, purely because, over time, they have experienced war like no one else on that planet. They will have been to several different environments, faced off against several different types of alien or heretic, and will have experience... Uh, that the others couldn't dream of and and can take charge and take command at a moment's notice. Don't mess with that guy. He was <laughs> there on planet Jello 49. <laughs> Key Lime Pie Wars. <laughs> Key Lime Pie Wars. <laughs> um, you weren't there, man. You weren't there. There was cream and custard everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in general, each basic entity, each basic organizational kind of... Uh, uh, layer within the Imperial Guard, it starts with a squad. And a squad is 10 soldiers, including a heavy weapons team and a sergeant and a special weapons trooper who has either a grenade launcher or a melt gun or a plasma gun or a flamer. There are squads then that augment that. So you'll have heavy weapon squads, which in general are three heavy weapons teams, or you'll have special weapons squads, which are six troopers, three of which will have special weapons. These special weapon squads can include snipers. So you start seeing kind of the versatility of the Imperial Guard squad and platoon system come together quite quickly. These then rank up, as it were. You go from squad to platoon. There's between two and five squads per platoon, platoon to company there's between three and five platoons per company and then a regiment you have uh, somewhere between one and ten companies within a regiment uh, 
at each level, there is a command squad uh, and command apparatus within uh, at that level. You also include the commissariat. These are the political officers. These are the, well, they're the commissars of the Russian army uh, from World War II. These are the ones that make sure that the laws are being followed, that there's no talk of heresy or desertion. They're empowered to execute any imperial soldier or officer who talks about retreating or talks about failure in any way. They're making sure that the atrocities, effectively what they're doing is they're making sure the atrocities of the Horus heresy are not repeated in terms of lack of vigilance of their own troops. And thus each regiment then as a, uh, operates as a distinct force. Uh, so you can charge a regiment with uh, manning a fortress world. Obviously, you'll need more than one, but they can look after, uh, uh, you know, they can defend a city quite easily with their uh, the, the troops. So they can defend a city quite capably. Um, yeah. Except if one of those fucking huge torpedoes from one of those massive batteries from <laughs> suborbital yeah, yeah, yeah. space comes and lands on their head, right? Yeah, but yeah. then, but then, very, very little can protect against that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The efficacy of uh, that regiment is is purely based on its foot troops. That is not to say that there are regiments that effectively only ever field foot troops, only ever field individual squads with supporting weapons. A lot of regiments are mechanized, and that's where you get into the Chimera armor personnel carrier, uh, which can carry up to 12 troops at a time. Uh, You're looking then also at uh, armored uh, warfare. Uh, You've got the Lehman Rust tank, which is the, uh, the kind of mainstay of the Imperial Guard, and that chassis is named after the Primarch of the Space Wolves. In some of the earlier editions, there was such a kind of high regard held for the Lehman Russ tank, you could actually field it in a Space Wolves army. Hmm. You could use that link there. What, with Imperial Guard on it? No, just it would be a Space Marine tank, and it would just happen to be a Lehman Russ tank. Um, There are... uh, Many, many variations on the Lehman Russ. You've got the Lehman Russ Demolisher, which is used for breaching armored emplacements. You have the um, Lehman Russ Punisher, which has an enormous jungle moor autocannon sat on top of it, like from Predator, where the guy just hoses down uh, the right, jungle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that can, mm. that can take out entire infantry squads in a single blast. But then you get into um, tanks designed to take out other tanks, such like the Vanquisher or the Executioner, which deal with anti-tank weaponry. But it should be noted that you can have entire regiments that are simply tanks. I mean, they've got people in them. It's not just tanks rolling around by themselves. Uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> Who didn't leave the handbrake on? <laughs> they also have uh, one of the more common kind of lightly armored vehicles they have is a thing called a sentinel which is a a walker like a if you could imagine a lego atst that's effectively what it looks like uh, Mm -hmm, from star mm -hmm. wars doesn't sound very stable though they're they're very swift, almost scout like vehicles, but the, you you end up with kind of two variations, which are the scout walker, but then you have the anti armor walker, which has an armored canopy and like a las cannon or a missile launcher, and they're used to uh, harass larger enemy formations and try and kind of find out weaknesses and what have you in the enemy. Yeah. So yeah, so you have then. Uh, infantry regiments, you have armoured regiments, you have mechanised infantry, which are infantry regiments that ride in the Chimera APCs. But then you have some of the more kind of strange and esoteric companies and regiments, usually company size, that are attached, that can be attached to assist in any, any given mission that's required by the uh, the kind of the warlords, the war masters, the colonels. In terms of infantry, you'll find that squads of ratlings, which are space halflings, 
are attached, and these are sniper units. These are fantastically oh, cool. uh, well-respected snipers who are halflings. They also tend to be quartermasters, so they deal in the kind of trade of uh, uh, equipment and goods. And there is a universally kind of known but not prosecuted black market within the Imperial Guard run by space halflings Thank as you. they ship uh, equipment and luxury goods from place to place to kind of curry favor with each other. Do, are they considered abhumans? Those are abhumans because it's a stable mutation. Right. Uh, uh, so ratlings, when they breed, uh, give birth to ratlings. Uh, right, so okay. it is a stable mutation. Uh, the same is true of ogrins, space ogres. These are squads of uh, five to ten ogres led by uh, a sergeant level kind of ogre who's undergone a cognitive improvement process referred to <laughs> as bonehead. So they've had their intelligence uh, raised artificially by wow. the kind of apothecaries of the Imperium. In general, they are fanatically religious, but in a childlike way. They will right. do anything that a commissar tells them because they view commissars as a direct mouthpiece of the emperor, and they worship the emperor like the ecclesiarchy could wish that everyone could. They have... No fear whatsoever if they believe that the emperor is pleased with them and the emperor is watching them. They will <laughs> start. They they will take down an enemy titan by themselves if they believe the emperor is watching. Um, by any chance, is one of the four characters that you see on the front of that game Dark Tide? Is that an ogrin? It's like that's human, an ogrin, the giant fella. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, interesting. Um, and so. Uh, there's various types of uh, loadouts and equipment that the Ogrins have, which we'll get into when we discuss the uh, Astra Militarum uh, in more detail. Uh, their main weapon is what's referred to as a ripper gun, which is a huge combat shotgun. Uh, and so they will just charge in and blast anything. And the, the Ripper gun is so well made, uh, and it has to be, because when they get too close, what they'll do is they'll grab the barrel of it and start twatting enemies on the top of the head. Uh, <laughs> just, <laughs> so it's, they use it as a club, a club effect. <laughs> Amazing. Nice. An another one that should be noted are the Rough Rider cavalry squads. So you actually have horse-based cavalry as opposed to chicken-based cavalry, uh, <laughs> who are very much taken directly from World War I. You have, effectively, soldiers on horseback with explosive lances charging directly at the enemy, uh, and the most famous being the Attila Rough Riders, uh, it's a, a famous Rough Rider regiment. So you can imagine that a full mixed force Imperial Guard regiment will be Human based sold or human soldiers plus mechanized support, either as tanks or the sentinel walkers, plus artillery, plus air cover from the Imperial Navy, and maybe a couple of squads of rattling snipers, uh, a platoon of ogrins under the command of a commissar, and some cavalry units held in reserve to skirmish or to push a breach in the enemy's the enemy's defenses. These are the kind of soldiering assets that the, an Imperial regiment can call upon. There are other assets such as a, a naval liaison officer, so they can do pinpoint lance strikes at enemy formations or enemy fortifications. They have astropaths who will be able to communicate more effectively with their uh, their peers in system, so allow a greater level of coordination of the imperial forces. You have psychers, battle psychers, called the Primaris battle psychers, who are you know they wield the power of the warp uh, and are able to protect the loyal imperial forces against the enemies uh, of the imperium, and you know such as warp warp entities like demons or chaos sorcerers or mutants or psychers um, but they are always followed by a commissar they're always accompanied and at the <laughs> moment he's got his hand on his gun 
Yeah, all joking aside, the moment they flinch, a commissar will shoot them in the back of the head. Uh, uh, <laughs> or the front of the head. Who can say? It just depends where he's standing, really. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, why are they called Primaris? I don't know. They're, they are the primary battle psychers of the human regiments. They're not related to Primaris Space Marines at all. Okay, are Primaris Space Marines also called that because they are the prime now the primary uh, form of Space uh, Marines? Yes, is, right. is the short and sad answer. Yeah. Oh. The biggest infield assets that an Imperial Guard regiment can call upon are the super heavy tanks. These are tanks that are about the size of a sports hall and can take out entire city blocks at a time. And they're usually fielded in one or a squadrons of one to three. The most famous being a Bane blade. It has two main battle cannons, six heavy bolters, and a handful of auto cannons. And then there are variations on that. But in general, what happens is, or, or in general, the most common variants of such tanks, of the Bane blade, uh, are built around the weapon that would be on a Titan, on these giant walking robots. So you see, cool. you know, macro plasma cannons, laser batteries that could take out a Titan. Uh, they're really wow. anti-heavy vehicle weapons, but some of them also are used for bombardments. There is a, oh God, what the fuck is the name of it? It's a, a, a super heavy tank that is uh, has been converted into a troop transport, so you can get an entire platoon in the back of it, but the weapon at the front is two huge assault cannons, you know, these rotary cannons, mm, and it can... Like a minigun. Decimate, yeah, it can decimate, but these are miniguns that are six foot wide and can sure. decimate uh, entire uh, companies of enemies huh. and allow you then to deploy your troops on the battlefield. Uh, it should be noted that most of these, in fact, almost all of these super heavy tanks are what's called relic weapons. They, each individual sh chassis existed thousands of years ago. And indeed, a lot of these super heavy tanks, you can draw a straight line from them to their construction during the Great Crusade or indeed the Horus Heresy. <laughs> wow. uh, when the technology required for their construction was more well known. Mm. Do these things not fucking rust? <laughs> uh, well, each tank is assigned a, what's referred to as an engine seer. So this is a an adeptus mechanic, a rust adeptus cleric, me a rust cleric, an adeptus mechanicus priest, whose right. only function is to keep that vehicle going. Why? 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 And we'll talk about the adeptus mechanicus next episode. Oh, it might be worth mentioning very briefly the types of regiments out there. Now, we, we've mentioned the Kachan jungle fighters who specialize yeah. in jungle fighting. Saying um, stuff funny. Saying stuff funny. Uh, the most famous Imperial Guard regiments are taken from the world of Cadia. These are the Cadian shock troops. Do you remember last episode we talked about... They have Brummie accents. Cadian. <laughs> what would you call them? Cadian. Cadian shock, shock troops. troops. Cadian. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> So for the, the Cadian shock troops to the Imperial Guard are like the Ultramarines to the Space Marines and the Order of the Martyred Lady to the, the Battle Sisters. These are the poster boys for the Imperial wow. Guard. So a lot there's a lot of art about them. They're the ones that are held up as the kind of uh, the archetypal. So the Cadian shock troops would really be the SAS's SAS. So these are the, the hardest troops, the ones that are constantly up against it, hugely outnumbered, and almost always come out victorious. Um, so these are the veterans, really, I suppose what I'm trying to say. These, these are the regiments that could you could trust them to hold not just a city, but a whole battle line, you know, augmented with some additional uh, support from the various types of auxilla that uh, exist. And the auxilla includes, in general, the abhuman troops so the ogrins the ratlings to some extent the beastmen as well we didn't really talk about that but the beastmen regiments are organized exactly like regular regiments but they're deployed in companies 
or indeed in platoons. And I believe we came up with what was it? A growl of a gur? A, a gur. It was a gur. A yeah. gur. A gur of, of the col- the collective things or troops. Given the different types of biomes that are available, the types of planets, you do have uh, regiments that specialize or or are used to fighting in frozen conditions or in desert conditions and those would be the Valhallen Ice Warriors, there are many regiments of them, and the Talarn Desert Raiders again, ice or frozen tundra and desert conditions, they specialise in both of those in that order you have a regiment called the Mordian Iron Guard now these are, they're really I suspect based on the American Marines and they only ever go to battle in their dress uniform. They have no fatigues. There's no combat uniform. <laughs> they they are required to look as if they're on parade ground, even in the midst of battle. So they're constantly polishing their shoes, repairing their uh, clothes, getting themselves cleaned ironing up. Ironing the creases out of the shirt in the middle of the battle. Combat oh. ironing. Ironing creases yeah, yeah, yeah. into their trousers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Whole nine yards. The only other two regiments I, I'd uh, bring up at this stage, or sorry, in fact, you know what? I'm going to go three. One is the the Elysian Drop Troopers. These are paratroopers, a regiment of paratroopers that require transport and support from the Imperial Navy. When we discussed the Navy, we talked about the, the Valkyrie gunships, the Vendetta gunships, the transports that can bring in, like the Hueys in Vietnam. These will drop their troops in from, from a fairly high altitude, and they are equipped with grav chutes, which is effectively a backpack with two arms that has two jet engines on it that kind of blasts a couple of feet above the ground. So they plummet at terminal velocity until they get within 20 feet of the ground. And then these things, these backpacks go off uh, and it jars them. And many of them go unconscious during training when it's, uh, <laughs> uh, when they're, well, when they're being trained. I mean, surely just make it go off a bit earlier. It doesn't have to be all compressed into the last 20 feet. Well, you're dealing with a battlefield situation. They do it in, in our own world with halo drops, high altitude, low opening, halo. Mm. You don't want to be caught drifting down over a battlefield <laughs> because <laughs> the enemy has snipers. Yeah. <laughs> so you can move this parachute and this top with a target on it. What's that all about? <laughs> <laughs> so the next regiment is the Armageddon Steel Legion. And these are a mechanized uh, regiment. Each regiment has its own support uh, system, including Chimera, armored personnel carriers and they're a very swift moving regiment or swift moving type of regiment that is based on the hive world of armageddon so this has a mixture of ash wastes from hive world production but also jungles that are thick thick i say with orc raiders so they're Mm. uh, adept at kind of swift repositioning lightning assaults uh, you know hit and run tactics but on a regimental scale the final regiment we'll talk about uh, appears in the gaunt's ghost series of books so this is a, a kind of light regiment a light infantry regiment whose world came under attack as they were being formed, as they were being loaded onto the troop carriers. So only a single regiment that was actually ever created. And over the series of novels, they've slowly been whittled down, or the original regiment has been slowly whittled down to a handful of named characters, uh, but they have been reinforced a couple of times. Mm. But they specialize in stealth attack. And as I say, they're a light infantry regiment, that has uh, very little in the way of attached support. But definitely, uh, for listeners, it's worth a read. The Gaunt's Ghosts is what they're called. Their regimental commander is a colonel, but also a commissar. So he is uh, as hard-nosed as hard-nosed can be. And he is the he has his own regiment, in fact. That's cool. That sounds like a good setting for a video game, actually, The Gaunt's Ghost. Yeah, of course, of course, it would be actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. 
So beyond the kind of minutia of regimental organization, you do, as you climb up the kind of rank ladder, you get into the kind of general staff, like high command of the Imperium. And ultimately, the Astra Militarum in its entirety is led by a, a Lord Commander militant who is the supreme commander of the Imperial Guard, but also a High Lord of Terra. Uh, and then as it breaks down, you, it very much mirrors the rank structure and organizational structure of the Imperial Navy, where you have the Lord Commanders, and there's five of them, one for each segmentum. And then you get down into kind of sector level organization with uh, Lord Generals and uh, Lord General Militants. There is a staggering amount of information for the Astra Militarum. I mean, we've not even touched on the, uh, if you can imagine the Astra Militarum, the basic Astra Militarum trooper is on par with the discipline and skill of a member of special forces from our own world. They themselves have special force regiments called the, the Tempestus. And each one of these is, if you can imagine Arnold Schwarzenegger's character from the movie Commando, mm. it's regiments of these guys. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> Cheesy as fuck. Yeah, yeah. Cheesy as fuck. <laughs> and on their way to being the uh, Californian governor. <laughs> the hunter governor. Hide your housekeepers, yeah. But that's real. I mean, as I said at the start, there's untold billions of soldiers, all incredibly highly trained and and well equipped. In quotes, by the departmental, the munitorium. Sorry, deep, yeah, the munitorium. And these are regarded as the the sledgehammer of the emperor's forces. If you want to break a planet, they have wave after wave of their own men to throw at it. <laughs> I don't write Brannigan's law. I mean, yeah. force it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, possibly the most straightforward of the kind of lore to relate to because it, its structure, besides the more esoteric units and uh, troop types that are attached to it, mirrors very much, uh, you know, the Western European and American structure of uh, military regiments. Wow. Thoughts? Fuck me. My thoughts are <laughs> the the sheer size of the Imperium of Man's military. I mean, fighting a war is an expensive business, you know, at the best yeah. of times. So every resource, every citizen, every non-military citizen that's put to work, surely everything is gets channeled, all finances, all resources get channeled towards the military so that they can dominate, commandeer new planets, new frontiers, whilst also defending their existing. Yeah. My follow-up question to that then is, once the Emperor has fulfilled his wish of conquering the galaxy, theoretically, it never happens or never will happen, we know that, but like, yeah. let's say he did. What happens then? What's his ultimate dream once he's ticked that box? And what happens to the military after that? Well, Same as the mean Thunder Warriors? Same as say, yeah, for the vast majority of them, it would be the same as the Thunder Warriors. The issue really is, is that you're looking at a, a you know, a totalitarian galactic government, which makes the term totalitarian almost redundant in how totalitarian it is. Sure, <laughs> bro. Do you even totalitarian? Yeah, it, it, <laughs> bro. Tato. <laughs> it is the problem with uh, dictatorships, even in our own world. The amount of effort required to ensure compliance it almost makes it not worth it. Sure. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. If you have to concern yourself with the inner thoughts of every single citizen in the Imperium and at a moment's notice, regardless of external thoughts, regardless or, or external threats, so exclude aliens. If you have a, a planetary governor that throws a nutty and suddenly secedes from the Imperium, you're going to need soldiers to bring them back in line. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Or will you? Segwaying to the assassins. 
Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. We'll close out the uh, the discussion of the, the kind of military regiments of or the military capacity of the Imperium with what's referred to as the Dagger of the High Lords or the scalp, indeed the scalpel of the High Lords. These are the uh, Officio Assassinorum. These are arguably four. It's been expanded to be seven different temples of assassins. These origins, the origins of these temples date back to, you guessed it, the Horus Heresy. When during the Great Crusade, the emperor himself uh, was quoted as saying, no world shall be we beyond... Need some fucking assassins, bro. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> no, <say> that. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? To sorry, I ruined the impact <laughs> of that statement. <laughs> I was halfway through the fucking quote. He said, no world shall be beyond my rule, no enemy shall be beyond my wrath. And within ah. a day, within <laughs> a day of him saying that, a group of people got together and formed the assassin clades, as they're referred to, the temples of the assassins. Their, really, their real purpose, uh, certainly to kill, but who to kill? Uh, if you can that's avert... The art. That's that, the skill, that isn't is it? The Anyone can kill. Yeah. Anyone can kill. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. who you kill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you can, uh, you know, you, you suspect that there's a planetary governor that's going to rebel against the Empire or you suspect is thinking, or is reading too many naughty books and is going to head towards chaos. Do you really have the resources to send several regiments and a battle fleet to carry them, or can you dispatch a single assassin to take them out? And thus, the next in line comes in, you know, and if the if the death was gruesome enough, perhaps so they've learned their lesson. Yeah, it sends a message. There are also times where a, a popular governor is revealed to be actually quite incompetent. And so instead of going to the effort of removing him and nominating a successor, again, there might be questions of rebellion, or indeed there might be uh, questions about the activity of the Imperium within this uh, situation. Why not just send in a cheeky assassin to uh, take him out, uh, make it look like a natural death, and then no one has to worry about who said what to whom or did what with a badger? So are the different are the different clades are they different methods of assassination? Well, uh, you know that's literally just what I was about to start talking about. So do, do yeah, you and you and me, you and me, <laughs> hive mind, mate, hive mind. Yeah. It's like we're related. <laughs> the the four most common types of assassin come from the following temples: the Kalidas Temple, the Calexus Temple the Evasor Temple, and the Vindicare Temple. In order, the Kalidas Temple deal in a stealthy kill. These are shapeshifters. They use something called polymorphine that allows them to change their facial features, their body size, and in some cases, even their gender. There has been Like the one Alpha Legion? Better than the Alpha Legion. Okay. No, I yeah. meant. Um, yeah, I think you mentioned that the Alpha Legion used that chemical as well. The, yeah, they the they can use polymorphine. Yeah, um, Poly there's, there's been one <laughs> instance of a Kalidas assassin masquerading as a, a like a nurse within a planetary governor's within a governor's palace was actually mm. able to using polymorphine distend their body and jaw and swallow the child whole and carry them out in their stomach uh, to be regurgitated what? later. And suddenly the imperial forces had the, the firstborn of the governor as a hostage to ensure compliance. So an Man. assassin's job is not always to kill. But the, the Kalidas temple specialize in infiltration in uh, replacing a target where the assassin will take on that persona. They're equipped with po a series of poison needles for stealthy kill, but they also have a gun, which is referred to as a neural shredder, which is 
a psychic flamethrower that will shred all your neurons in your brain and turn you into a vegetable. <laughs> they, if that wasn't enough they're also equipped with what's referred to as a Catan phase sword which is do you remember uh, Terminator 2 with the liquid Terminator mm. it's that but it's a sword that comes out okay. of their wrist uh, interestingly it's referred to as a Catan phase sword because it's made out of the same necrodermis the same liquid metal that the Catan were uh, were trapped in by the Necrons, which we will deal with in about 10 episodes' time. So cool. it's a Xenos weapon. Wow. Of interesting note, the Kalidas assassins are almost all exclusively female. It's to do with the capacity for polymorphine and the flexibility that's required. Um, and indeed... Uh, the most famous assassin within the Kalidas Temple is an assassin called Mshen, M Shen, uh, mm, and she assassinated. Shen. Spoiler, spoiler alert! <laughs> she successfully assassinated the Primarch of the Nor of the Night Lords Legion, Conrad oh, Kurz. Oh. If you recall, evil Batman, uh, mm, and we'll yeah. get into that story. Batman. When we, we'll deal with the um, Night Lords. The, uh, the next one is the Calexus Temple, and these are anti-Psyker assassins. These assassins are all pariahs. If you, uh, can either of you recall what a pariah is? Yeah. Can you? <laughs> yeah. I like the way you went. That was just like, uh, well, I could, but I'd like to hear you explain it, Darren. <laughs> I don't know who I am, but what are you? Is it somebody without a soul who kind of acts like a little bit of a like a nullifying force? Yes, exactly right for psychic energy and psychic powers. Again, these are you know masters of death uh, with their limbs. Uh, they don't actually need none of these assassins need weapons to be able to kill someone. But the Calexus assassin is specifically designed to take out psychers of any race and of any kind of origin. They are armed with kind of two real types of weapon. The first is psych out grenades. If you recall, these are grenades made out of the dust from the soul binding process and the feeding process oh, with yeah. the emperor. So these are uh, effectively psychic frag grenades that fuck psychers up. Mm. They also have a helmet that looks like the alien in uh, in or the xenomorph in the alien movies, and that's equipped with a weapon referred to as the animus speculum. And so it it looks like effectively a skull with one enormous metallic eye uh, and a tube going back into a very kind of ornate uh, helmet. When they open up the eye, when they open up that lens within the eye, the full anti psyker capacity of the pariah blasts forward and is a effectively fries anyone who is within its path, and so especially psychers. It ha I mean, it it will it will almost effectively kill a psyker outright, but it will also fuck up anyone else who gets in the way. These right, are okay. these are not kind of gentle weapons. We'll deal with the Vindica Vindicare or Vindicare Temple next. These are master snipers. That's effectively what they are. And they cool. are equipped with two weapons, the Exodus pistol and the Exodus rifle, both of which uh, fire or can fire various modified kind of ammunition uh, to take out enemies of really any type. The weapons are designed to fire in bursts of two or three, depending on the, the target and the mission. The most common one is the shield breaker round followed by a penetrator round. So if you can imagine a situation uh, cool. where there is a an enemy commander who has a personal force field, the first round will short out the force field, and the second round, which will follow almost immediately, takes off the head of the... Uh, of the target That's so they're amazing. equipped with various types of ammunition to handle various types of uh, target they can lie still for you know weeks at a time to be able to make sure that they can get a good view at a target 
I can lie still for weeks at a time. That's not that impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Give a man enough pot and he will stay stationary <laughs> for many, many days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but these guys will be eternally vigilant. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that? exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not armed with a bong and a bag <laughs> yeah. of crisps. Girl. Stay away, man. I got the munch. The, the final of the kind of major temple, and I say major temple because these four assassin types are available to play in the game on the tabletop. Oh, cool. Is the Eversore Temple. This is, how would you describe it? This is a mix between Angry Deadpool Freddy Krueger and Skeletor. That's really what we're Jesus dealing with here. Christ. It's a bit busy. <laughs> it is a bit busy. <laughs> These are, as again, assassins who don't require any weapons at all to be able to kill you. But an Eversor uh, assassin is sent in to send an object lesson, not only to perhaps the enemy, but also to the Imperium at whole. Uh, our, our Imperium as a whole within the local systems. They're so aggressive that when they're not on mission, they're kept in cryostasis. They can't be allowed out. They have to constantly be hunting. They are supremely violent and make no distinction between friend or foe. And they're usually deployed either in a boarding torpedo, if they're targeting another ship, or a, a, a single-seater uh, landing pod, and then they just go off and hunt. Now, they're equipped with uh, a bolt pistol that also has a needle pistol attached to it, and a needle pistol is something that fires out a small blast of laser energy, but within that blast is a crystalline form of poison, uh, that will instantly kill whoever it touches uh, or whoever it gets into. They also have a power sword to be able to cut into, uh, cut their way through bulkheads and doors and so forth. And they have what's referred to as a neuro gauntlet, which is if Freddy Krueger's glove was a lightsaber, that's how effective it would be. What? By any chance, there's a novel in the Heresy series. About the assassins. Oh, Nemesis. Like the cover. Yeah. Nemesis. By any chance, was that type of. I have a vague memory of there being a scene at the start of the book where one of those. Like, he, he, the guy's like massive and he's like jacked up on all manner of different chemicals and they basically activate him and then they fucking run away and he just goes off and fuck shit up. Is that. Is he one of them? If memory serves, yes. That that is one of them. There were all there was also a chaos assassin in there, who was the kind of bestial, which may have been the mm. chaos version of the Eversore. Um, but right, right. yeah, the Eversore. So, in addition to these four temples, these four clades of assassins, there are three others that are worth mentioning. The Adamus Temple is technically the oldest of the. Uh, Assassinorum clades. It was formed at the very start of the Great Crusade and interestingly is based on the first Imperial Assassin miniature uh, that was created by Games Workshop in, uh, in 87, which I have somewhere in a drawer. And so this is... Great story. Great story. It's a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a sword-based assassin type uh, dealing in decapitation uh, figuratively and literally and so they they are again masters of stealth they never have any side missions they're only ever intended to get into a facility kill the leader and leave uh that's it uh, and they are used both in advance of invasions or in advance of imperial invasions so as to disrupt the enemy they can be used to, instead of an invasion instead of the the kind of vast number of resources that's required for an imperial campaign, but they do uh, they do follow or sorry they do arrive with campaigns as well to be able to disrupt uh, enemy leadership as much as possible. The final two uh, temples were created at the same time as the the first four, 
during the uh, Great Crusade. They've just never had miniatures until recently, until the Horus Heresy game. Uh, the first is the Venenum, Venenum Temple. They deal in poisoning. Venenum. 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 And so on. And so on. So these are um, poisoners who can uh, not only supply time delayed poison, so they can poison someone and they won't die until two days later, allowing the assassin to leave, but they can also uh, genetically code poisons so they can put it into the water table of an entire city and the, only the person they're targeting will die. That's amazing. They have a staggering knowledge of poisons and chemicals, second only to the homunculus flesh uh, melders in the Dark Eldar city of Camorra in the Warp. They are absolute masters of poison, and many a rebellion has been stopped before uh, it got any further because someone ate a bowl of sugar puffs they shouldn't have ate. <laughs> poison puffs the final temple i just want to to bring up are the it's the vanus temple vanus from the latin meaning empty these are uh, ciphers insofar as they deal in intelligence they are able to kill without ever arriving on the planet whose governor or uh, merchant um... or commander or a specific soldier that they're targeted or they're tasked with getting rid of. They do this purely through bureaucracy and information. And so their ultimate goal is to be able to get someone to kill the other person many times without knowing that the person who does the killing actually killed them through some bureaucratic Mix up or rumor mill or kind of social assassination, uh, reputation destruction. Or an accident. Uh, it can be made to look like an accident, but at all times, it cannot be traced beyond the world that it's happening on. So the what's referred to as the info site. It's the name of each uh, different types of assassin. They will never leave their clade base or. You know, an orbiting starship is perhaps the closest they would ever get. Um, but they orchestrate uh, and manipulate the situation so that the target dies via someone else. And that someone else doesn't know perhaps that they've actually caused the death of someone and doesn't know that they actually have been an assassin. Uh, and kind of, targeted quite kind of like master chess player isn't it They're it's exactly like what it is yeah five or six moves ahead and they know that if they if they just leave this glass here then that guy will pick that glass up and so on and so forth and then the dude dies yeah absolutely amazing that's amazing. really cool dope and that's that's really that's really it for this episode i i mean i just wanted to highlight the difference in terms of the military might of the Imperium, because they can orbit it, or oh, <laughs> they can orbitally bombard a planet and then invade it en masse, or they can send one assassin in to fuck shit up and then it has the same effect. Mm. <laughs> well, if it has the same yeah, effect, why would you it. bother going for the big guns? Just do the little guns all the time. Well, when we're talking about heresy and rebellion within the Imperium, Sometimes you just need one person killed. If there's an open theater of war, you're if you know if a war has already started, you're going to need to send some uh, send in the grand cruiser with the battering ram. Yeah, absolutely. If it's an organization that has an easily replaceable leadership, yeah, an assassin's not really going to be able to do a huge amount there, are they? Yeah. Well, the moment it, they kill the leader, they'll just replace replace them. It it depends how long they're going to be on planet for like an eversore assassin will depopulate a planet until it's killed you have to mm. kill it an interesting and and when you kill it an eversore assassin has is their blood is so full of different volatile chemicals that it will literally explode and kill with poison because its blood is poison anyone within 20 feet hmm Wow, <laughs> that's bad. 
Mm-hmm. I just wanted to uh, uh, be Buzz Killington about some certain terminology again. There was the venomum, venomum, venenum, yeah, venenum clade, yeah, who use poisons. Venenum, yeah. The definition of a venom, you have to administer it like through a hypodermic needle or like through teeth, like a poisonous snake. Yeah, poisonous snake or a snake. Take a pick. And poison, <laughs> you like you can have, you, you can just you ingest. have to ingest poison. Yeah, yeah. So they need to take a look at themselves i think really those guys <laughs> got a, ve- a venom could be a poison though couldn't it like if you took venom so if you take venom out of a, a snake say yeah. and then you then apply it to a human being through their food yeah it would still kill them does that mean that the venom becomes a poison yeah i think it's just the way it's administered it's either injected into you or you lick a toad you know what i mean <laughs> well, <we've all> been there. <laughs> you get poisonous frogs or you get venomous steaks I keep calling them steaks. <laughs> Fuck it, venomous steaks. Unfortunately, we have all been there. Yeah. <laughs> In terms of their uh, administration and control, it, the assassins, the officio assassinorum, can only be engaged through the High Lords of Terra. That's how serious a threat has to be for an assassin uh, to be dispatched. Uh, and so- isn't the from memory isn't the th- the plot of that book nemesis is the high lords of terror ask all of the different clades to work together to try and assassinate horus yes yeah because i remember the info site guy as well the the kind of the hacker yeah the hacker basically yeah. not the hacker he's not a, <laughs> not a new zealand based rugby player but Yikes. yeah like he he was like able to like hack into the the systems while the other dudes were going in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's the way they're depicted in that book is absolutely cracking. I mean, it should be noted that yeah. even one of these can destabilize an entire planet, but there are threats where a formation of assassins where a member of each clade is assigned to a group. And that's referred to as an execution force. And that, that can depopulate a planet real quick mm. especially mm. if the venom decides whether he's uh just dropping stuff in <laughs> or injecting it in people yeah yeah, yeah. that's the choice he needs, but he needs to make his mind up yeah yeah because we will not have any of this grammatic well technically here's form. a question then if he has a if he has a syringe full of uh, highly toxic poison or venom and he injects it into a water pipe which then poisons everyone does that satisfy both definitions? Is that still venom or is it vo- is it poison? That's poison. They've had to ingest it. I, th- I guess venom is... But like he's injected it. Into he the water. It, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Still poison. Shut up. <laughs> well that's it that's it for this episode that's all my uh all my content that were out. grand that were that were grand I, obviously again for any, anyone who's still listening yes there are holes in it you can fly a battle cruiser through we'll get to it this is a summary but chill your boots people chill your fucking boots yeah <laughs> That's a warning. If you do send in any feedback, it will be met with Darren's rage. We will poison slash venomize you. Depending. <laughs> no way. Uh, okay, cool. So we wrap up. Yes. Yep. Hang on a second. I have a question. Okay. Chris, favorite type of assassin? Our favorite type of assassin. If you're going to say favorite unit, I was going to say ratlings, simply because they kind of they're part of the Imperium force. Because they're your height, but they're the troublemakers. <laughs> they're not trusted. <laughs> I can relate to them on a height basis as well. On a height, so level. I like them. You'd be but a wicked f- sniper, they... mate. You'd be a wicked sniper, like low center of gravity. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, favorite assassin. Uh, now you're making me remember the assassin types. You cunt. Right. So. There was the info guy, the, the hacker guy. There was the Eversore, the big brutey one. There was the uh, stealthy one, the snipery one, the poison one, and then there was two others that I can't the, Yeah, the psyker-based one as well. Psyker's a very specialist. The one. It would have to either be Eversore or the stealthy one. Probably stealthy. Mm. I do like a yeah. stealthy... 
So Ashen, Kalidus, Tyler, yeah. Um, thing. Kalida. Yeah, 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 I'm with yeah, you on yeah, the stealth yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah. What about you, what are you Ben? Uh, favorite uh, military, favorite military unit, ship type, favorite um, assassin? Just give us a couple. Okay. All right. So I agree with Chris. I think the stealth dudes are the, the dudiest dudes around. Um, yeah. I mean, the Gaunt's Ghost thing sounds like a bitch, and I, I, the books sound amazing. Uh, and the I love the idea of like. That the catering, the catering ships. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. They sound like. I'm surprised actually that the um the ratlings, given their halfling counterparts, penchant for cooking in the old world, weren't like the you know the guys that manned all of the in the mess, the, the kitchens and <laughs> the yeah in the, the mess. But yeah, no, I like the idea of like the SAS is SAS, the Tempest the SAS is yeah. SAS. The uh, sassy sass, the yeah, the, yeah. S- the sassy sass, yeah. And those, um, so the little ships that were uh, still jet engine, uh, like seven four sevens, that had three pilots. Oh, and, and the, the like, and a freaked out astropath. <laughs> and it's freaked out. So it's like a the, like a good drama. Yeah, it? I'd watch that TV show, man. The Fury Starfighters. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? My favorite assassin, hands down, is the Calexus assassin, the the psychic pariah assassin. Uh, but in terms of Imperial Guard, I like. There's a regiment called the Vostroyan Firstborn. They are a regiment that's constantly trying to make up for a perceived betrayal during the Horus Heresy. But I think they're the bee's knees in terms of just the unit design the uh, character design. It looks very much like a mix between Russia under the Tsar's elaborate kind of infantry dress outfit plus a bearskin hat. Cool. (laughs) Um, I feel like you had us at a disadvantage because you didn't mention those before. We've only just heard about them, so I'd like to change my answer to them as well. (laughs) (laughs) Right, shall I wrap up? Yeah, ma'am. All right, that's all from us. Thank you so much for listening. Details and imagery for the topics we've discussed in this podcast can be found on our website at layingdownthelore.com. We also have all our previous episodes on there, release schedules, merchandise, and you can sign up for the Laying Down the Lore newsletter, which includes exclusive info about upcoming releases, behind-the-scenes chat, and some extra lore not covered in the podcast. If you've enjoyed what you've heard in this episode and you want to support us, head over to patreon.com forward slash laying down the lore 40k and sign up today for as little as three pounds. This will give you access to our Discord server so you can come and tell us exactly what you think of Chris and his face. <laughs> I was about to say, and his assassin choices, but I chose exactly the same thing. You can just tell us about what you think about Chris. It's, it's fine. <laughs> we'll be back again soon displaying just how little Chris and I know. Until then, cheerio. Ta-ta, bye. He's behind you. <laughs> ah! <laughs>